This podcast contains murder and mayhem, guts and gore, adult language, and sexual content. Exactly what you came here for. All the listener discretion is advised. Welcome. I am your mistress of the macabre, Sarah Tierra. Grab your Ouija board, light the candles, and grab your jar of human teeth because you and I are going to escape for a bit. Pour yourself a cocktail, pull the window shades closed, and find a cool, dark, quiet place. Because right now we delve into the macabre. Hello and welcome back to the Mistress of the Macabre podcast. I am your host, Sarah Tierra. Welcome to serial killer foodie, Dorothea Puente. Did you know that she had a cookbook? Because I did, and we are going to go over it today. Now, you know a bitch loves to try to incorporate true crime and food. I've done it several times now. See the All About Executions episode and also the Mad Gaster of Mattoon, as well as the bonus Maunder episodes. I love the two things separately, and I also love them together. They don't intersect very often, but when they do, I am going to jump on that shit. So today we are fully doing a food and serial killer combo. Also, in today's episode, there might be a few more little tiny voice cracks than normal. I am trying to fight off an illness. I'm starting to get sick. I'm at the beginning, and I'm taking a lot of emergency and trying not to be sick. Just FYI, I do expect all of you to know who Dorothea Puente is, because if you're here listening to this podcast, you already know all the big true crime cases, and hers is covered over and over again. But if you didn't do your homework, that's okay too. I forgive you. I'll give you a quick rundown of who Dorothea is and why she's a monster. Dorothea Helen Puente was an American serial killer. In the 1980s, she ran a boarding house in Sacramento, California, and murdered various elderly and mentally disabled boarders before cashing their social security checks. Puente's total victim count reached nine murders. She was convicted of three, and the jury hung on the other six. Newspapers dubbed Puente the Death House Landlady. Puente was born Dorothea Helen Gray on January 9th, 1929 in Redlands, California. Her parents were both alcoholics and her father repeatedly threatened to kill himself in front of the children. Her father died of tuberculosis in 1937. Her mother, who worked as a sex worker, lost custody of her children in 1938 and died in a motorcycle accident by the end of the year. Puente and her siblings were subsequently sent to an orphanage where she was allegedly sexually abused. Dorothea's first marriage was at age 16 in 1945 to a soldier named Fred McFall, who had just returned from the Pacific after fighting in World War II. They had two daughters between 1946 and 1948. Dorothea sent one child to live with relatives in Sacramento and placed the other one up for adoption. She also suffered a miscarriage. McFall left her in late 1948. In the spring of 1948, Gray was arrested for... That's that's Puente. We're calling her Gray because she's not yet married. But Dorothea was arrested for purchasing women's accessories using forged checks in Riverside, California. She pled guilty to two counts of forgery, serving four months in jail and three years probation. Six months after her release, she left Riverside. In 1952, Dorothea married a merchant seaman, Axel Bren Johansson, great name, in San Francisco. She created a fake persona calling herself Tia Singoala Nayarda, rolls off the tongue, and pretending to be a Muslim woman of Egyptian and Israeli descent. Dorothea and Axel had a turbulent marriage. Dorothea took advantage of Johansson's frequent trips to sea by inviting men to their home and gambling away his money. Dorothea was arrested in 1960 for owning and operating a bookkeeping firm as a front for a brothel in... (laughs) Sorry. She's an entrepreneur, okay? Anyways, so it wasn't bookkeeping, it was a brothel in Sacramento, and she was found guilty and was sentenced to 90 days in the Sacramento County Jail. In 1961, Johansson had Dorothea committed to the DeWitt State Hospital after a spree of drinking, lying, criminal behavior, and suicide attempts. While in the institution, doctors diagnosed Dorothea as a pathological liar with an unstable personality. That seems 
spot on. Dorothea and Axel divorced in 1966, although she continued to use Johansson's name for some time following their separation. Dorothea assumed the identity next of Sharon Johansson, hiding her delinquent behavior by portraying herself as a devout Christian woman. She established her reputation as a caregiver, pretending to provide young women with a sanctuary from poverty and abuse without charge. We all know she was probably pimping those girls out. In 1968, Dorothea married Roberto Jose Puente. After 16 months, the couple separated, with Dorothea citing domestic abuse. In 1967, she attempted to serve him with a divorce petition, but Puente fled to Mexico, so the divorce wouldn't be finalized until 1973. The two would continue to have a turbulent relationship, and Dorothea filed a restraining order in 1975. Gray would continue to use the surname Puente for more than 20 years. Following her divorce, Puente focused on running a boarding house located near 15th and F Streets in Sacramento. She established herself as a resource to the community to aid alcoholics, homeless people, and mentally ill people by holding Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and assisting individuals to sign up to receive social security benefits. She changed her public image to that of a respectable older matron by putting on vintage clothing, wearing large granny glasses, and letting her hair turn gray. She also established herself as a respected member of Sacramento's Hispanic community, funding charities, scholarships, and radio programs. She eventually met and married Pedro Angel Montalvo, though Montalvo abruptly left the relationship one week after their marriage. On December 21st, 1978, Dorothea Puente was convicted of illegally cashing 34 state and federal checks that belonged to her tenants. She was given five years probation in order to pay $4,000 in restitution. On January 16th, 1982, Puente picked up Malcolm McKenzie, 74 years old, from a bar and took him back to his apartment. He reported that Puente had slipped something into his drink before robbing him of coins, watches, and other jewelry, including a diamond ring belonging to his mother, which she removed from his finger while he was incapacitated. On April 28, 1982, Ruth Monroe, 61, was found dead due to respiratory depression caused by a massive overdose of codeine. Monroe was reportedly in good health when she arrived at Puente's home just over two weeks prior to her death. However, by April 25th, she told a friend, quote, I am so sick, I feel like I am going to die, end quote. Monroe's death was originally ruled an undetermined overdose, but later classified as a homicide. On May 16th, 1982, Dorothy Osborne, 49, found checks, credit cards, and other items missing eight hours after Puente visited her home and prepared her a drink. In July of 1982, Puente was convicted of three grand theft charges. She was sentenced to five years in prison, state parole until March 21st, 1986, and her federal parole sentence was extended another two years until 1990. During her incarceration, she began corresponding with Everson Theodore Gilmouth, a 77-year-old retiree from Oregon. At the beginning of September in 1985, Gilmouth came to Sacramento with his truck and trailer and arrived at Puente's boarding house. On September 9, 1985, after serving only half of her sentence, Puente was released from prison, whereupon she was picked up by Gilmouth and Ricardo Oradorica, a close friend who lived with his family in the downstairs flat at 1426 F Street. In October of 1985, Puente wrote to Gilmouth's sister, informing her that she and Gilmouth were to be married on November 2nd. A short time later, Puente hired a handyman, Ismael Carrasco Flores, for remodeling and asked him to build a 6 foot by 30 inch by 30 inch storage box. She agreed to give him Gilmouth's truck and $800 as payment. The day after he completed the box, he returned to find the box nailed shut. Puente asked Flores to help her take the box, which now weighed approximately 300 pounds, to a storage location, but ended up dumping the box near a river about an hour away from Sacramento. Don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. What the fuck? 
Puente. On December 28, 1998, it was determined that Gilmouth was the previously unidentified body discovered by a fisherman alongside the Sacramento River on January 1, 1986. Gilmouth's body was wrapped in numerous plastic bags and covered with a bedsheet held in place by electrical tape. Mothballs and blue toilet deodorizer were also found inside the box. It was later discovered that after Gilmouth's death, Puente mailed fake letters and cards to his sister in an attempt to make her believe that he was still alive. Puente was also found to have forged Gilmouth's signature on his truck certificate of title and continued cashing Gilmouth's benefit checks until July of 1986. In the fall of 1986, Betty May Palmer, 78, arrived at Puente's boarding house. On October 14, 1986, Puente obtained a California ID card with her photo and Palmer's name. Two months later, the mailing address on Palmer's social security checks was changed to Puente's F Street address. Puente forged Palmer's signature and cashed nearly $7,000 worth of benefit checks belonging to Palmer. In November of 1988, Palmer's partially dismembered body was discovered in a shallow hole in Puente's front yard. Her head, hands, and lower legs were never found. Toxicology reports revealed the presence of doxylamine, an over-the-counter antihistamine, as well as haloperidol and fluorazepam, both of which were previously prescribed to Palmer. She was identified on January 24th, 1989, through comparison to previous medical x-rays. On October 21st, 1986, Puente summoned a notary to the hospital room of Leona Carpenter, 78, following a fluorazepam overdose. She was given the power of attorney over Carpenter and began cashing her social security checks just 10 days later. In December, after Carpenter was released from the hospital, she went to live with Puente. Once again, Carpenter returned to the hospital, and just a few weeks after she was discharged, in February 1987, she disappeared. In November 1988, her body was found in the southeastern corner of Puente's yard. Toxicology reports of Carpenter's brain tissue revealed the presence of codeine, diazepam, and fluorazepam. In February 1987, James Gallup, 62, moved into Puente's home. On July 20th, 1987, a potentially malignant tumor was found in Gallup's colon. He agreed to further testing, but Puente later contacted his doctor's office, notifying them that he had gone to Los Angeles indefinitely. Gallup's body was found buried under a gazebo in Puente's yard in November of 1988. Toxological testing of Gallup's brain and liver revealed the presence of amitriptyline, noritriptyline, phenytoin, and fluorazepam. In July 1987, Eugene Gamel, 58, was found dead of an apparent suicide having overdosed on amitriptyline and ethanol. Puente, who was Gamel's landlady, said he had a history of suicide attempts. Though Puente was never charged with Gamel's murder, he was considered a possible victim. On October 2nd, 1987, Vera Faye Martin, 61, was sent to live with Puente. Starting October 5th, 1987, 87, Puente forged a number of Martin's social security checks, totaling over $7,000. On October 19, 1987, Martin failed to contact her daughter on her birthday, which she had done every year. In November 1988, Martin's body was found buried under a metal shed in Puente's yard. Toxicology reports of her brain and liver revealed fluorazepam. On October 21, 1987, Dorothy Miller, 65, was placed in an upstairs flat in Puente's home. She introduced Miller to Ricardo or Dorica and the following November, Ordorica became the representative payee for Miller's Social Security benefits. Just weeks after her arrival, Miller had disappeared, and on November 20th, 1987, Puente hired a carpet cleaner to remove a large pile of foul-smelling slime in Miller's room. Puente continued to forge Miller's checks, totaling over $11,000, after she was no longer at her house. Miller's remains were later discovered buried underneath a slab of concrete near some rose bushes in, you guessed it, Puente's yard. Tissue samples from Miller's brain revealed the presence of, you guessed it, fluorazepam. 
On November 29th, 1987, Brenda Trujillo sent a letter to the Social Security office in Sacramento accusing Puente of stealing her Social Security checks, totaling $3,500. Trujillo met Puente in the Sacramento County Jail in 1982, and the two later shared a prison cell. After her release, Trujillo moved into Puente's boarding house, where Puente helped her apply for Social Security benefits. Trujillo claimed that Puente drugged her and called her parole officer, causing her parole to be revoked before Trujillo received the checks. That is some fucking shady shit, Puente. In February 1988, Alvaro Bert Gonzalez Montoya, 51, arrived at Puente's home. In March, an application designating Puente as Montoya's benefits payee was filed. At the end of August, a roommate saw a man clearing Montoya's clothes out of the closet. He missed an appointment on August 29th and was last seen on August 24th. Puente told several people that Montoya went to Mexico to visit his relatives. Social workers continued to attempt to contact Montoya in September and October, but to no avail. In November, Puente asked Donald Anthony, a former convict who had been working in her yard, to contact the social worker pretending to be Montoya's brother-in-law. He agreed and started stating his name was Michael Obergon and that he picked up Montoya from the F Street house and took him to Utah. The social worker was suspicious and told Puente that she was going to call the police. Nice fucking try, dumbass. On November 10th, the social worker received a letter purportedly from Michael Obergon, wrapped in a paper towel to avoid fingerprints. Days later, Montoya's body was found buried adjacent to Carpenter. Toxicology testing revealed the presence of loxapine, lorazepam, tipenhydramine, amitriptyline, and carbamazepine. Montoya had prescriptions for all of these drugs except for the carbamazepine. On March 9, 1988, Benjamin Fink, 55, was sent to live with Puente. Why are people still sending people to her fucking house at this point? I mean, come on. Fink's brother visited him on a weekly basis for six weeks. By the end of April, Fink was gone. Another tenant reported smelling a foul odor emanating from his room, but was told by Puente that it was a sewer backup. On April 29, Puente received 12 bags of cement. That June, she had dug a hole next to the door of the metal shed, which was later filled with concrete. In November, Fink's body was discovered in this area, wrapped in a plastic knotted bedspread and secured with duct tape. He was also covered with blue absorbent pads. His toxicology report revealed the presence of amitriptyline, loxapine, and florazepam. On November 7th, 1988, police spoke with John Sharp, a former resident, about the disappearance of Montoya. Initially, Sharp told the police that he had seen Montoya two days earlier, but then slipped a note to the officer that said, quote, She wants me to lie to you. End quote. He later met with an officer to tell his story. On November 11th, 1988, a detective returned to Puente's residence and, with her permission, began digging in areas that appeared to be recently disturbed. 30 minutes later, he discovered the first body. Just hours after a body was discovered in her backyard, Puente slipped away from police. Yes, that's right. Highlight of this story. On November 13th, 1988, an All Points Bulletin was issued for Puente. Uh, the story, as I recall it, is she they literally found a body in her yard. And she's sitting there like all fidgety being like, um... Yeah, I'm just going to go grab a cup of coffee while you keep digging. And the police were like, sure, sounds good. And she took off. I mean, come on. Why would you let her go? So stupid. And then they found all the other bodies. And by that time, she's in the wind. She's out of there. On November 16th, 1988, Charles Wilgus, along with Jean Silver of CBS, alerted police to Puente's whereabouts at a motel in Los Angeles. Wilgus met Puente, who was using the alias Donna Johansson, the day before at a nearby bar. He later recalled seeing her on a CBS morning newscast and reached out to Jean Silver, who met with Wilgus at his apartment. 
The two contacted local law enforcement and Puente was arrested the same day. On March 31st, 1989, an amended complaint was filed charging Puente with nine counts of murder with special circumstance qualifying it as a death penalty case. Puente pleaded not guilty. Puente's trial began on February 9th, 1993. By the conclusion of the trial, 156 witnesses testified, more than 3,100 exhibits had been submitted, and over 22,000 pages of transcript were recorded. After deliberating for 11 days, on August 2nd, 1993, the jury told Judge Michael J. Verga that they were deadlocked on all nine counts of murder and asked for further instruction. The next day, Verga ordered the jury to resume their efforts to break the deadlock. On August 26th, 1993, Puente was convicted on three counts of murder. Benjamin Fink, Leona Carpenter, and Dorothy Miller. The jury, after deliberating for 35 days, remained deadlocked on six cases. Ruth Monroe, Everson Theodore Gilmouth, Betty Mae Palmer, James Gallup, Vera Faye Martin, and Alvaro Gonzalez Montoya. During the penalty phase of the trial, jurors found themselves deadlocked once again, and on October 13, 1993, Puente was spared the death penalty. On December 10, 1993, she was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. She was incarcerated at Central California Women's Facility in Chowchilla, California. Puente died in prison at Chowchilla on March 20. 27th, 2011 from natural causes. She was 82 years old. While in prison and before her death, Dorothea made a pen pal friend. His name was Shane. Shane became a fanboy of Dorothea and they wrote to each other, sent gifts and talked on the phone three times a week. Why would anyone fanboy over a serial killer? It's called hybristophilia, and we don't have time to get into it today, but we will certainly be talking about it in the future. But it is a thing, and I disapprove strongly, to put it mildly. But truly, this dude is starstruck by her, and it makes my skin crawl. And this pen pal friendship is where this fucking book comes from. It's a whole thing. And we're going to talk about all of it. The thing Shane wanted to know the most about from Dorothea was her recipes. Her cooking was focused on in the trial with former tenants coming forward to say people wanted to be in her care because of her amazing cooking. Everyone went on and on about what a good cook she was. So naturally, Shane spent the next three years writing Dorothea's cookbook. (laughs) Naturally, that was sarcasm. Dorothea is dead, and I did not give money to her or her estate by buying this book. I just don't want you guys to think that I support human trash or anything that she did. I really just wanted to make fun of this book, okay? Now that you know how this book came to be, we have to talk a little bit about the author. I feel I would not be doing my due diligence if I did not tell you this information. Right off the bat here, this episode is a critique and review of the book, Cooking with a Serial Killer, Recipes from Dorothea Puente. I learned a lot about the author of this book after finishing up this episode, and what I found was troubling for many reasons, which I will tell you in just a minute. I have taken out the last name of the author, but it is stated in the sources, seeing as his book was used as a source. He seems to think that he is very famous, so the chances that he has multiple Google alerts of his own name are, in my opinion, high. So I will state, Once again, this is both a review of and criticism of this book. The opinions are my own about the book as well as the author, and they are just that, my opinions. All that being said, let me tell you a little bit about this person. This person benefited from the sale of this book of recipes that he wheedled from serial killer Dorothea Puente. He also sold paintings done by John Wayne Gacy in the past. We haven't gotten into the ethics of murderabilia yet on this show, but we most definitely will. I am against it entirely. He also sells murderabilia online. He is a self-proclaimed serial killer expert and has toured with the potentially allegedly stolen gravestone of Ed Gein. He is a very vocal Satanist, which I was like, cool, Satanists are usually very chill people who live and let live. 
Mm, no comment. He seems to fancy himself a very famous public figure in the Satanist podcast community, which I think is a bit much. He has aligned himself with the alt-right and white nationalism. In 2001, he organized and extensively promoted a new tour entitled The Angry White Male Tour, the artwork of which was decorated with Confederate flags. It featured, quote, Dana Plato's last breath, end quote, an expose of the death of a child star from different strokes. He had become her manager and recorded her dying and then paraded that audio around in this tour. Also included in this tour package is Porn by Velveeta, an illustrator for Screw and Horny Biker Slut, a video of Brawlin' Broads, the catalog for Mike Hunt Publishing, which is run by this person, which includes Manson Speaks, Jim Jones Live from Ghana, Alistair Crowley Live Rituals and Chants CD, the Pam Anderson Brett Michaels Home Video, which is listed in this tour as See Pam Suck and Fuck, Lucky Candles, available in the Manson, LaVey, Crowley, and Betty Page domination versions, Crime Scene Photos, and The Greeting Cards of Carnage featuring surgery stills of torn out guts, a bullet wound, a torn open stomach stapled shut, and a man with a flesh-eating virus laying dead on an operating table. The words angry white male emblazoned across a confederate flag happens to be the poster design selected for this tour. The angry white male tour, designed largely as a vehicle for Mike Hunt publishing, seems to aspire to testing the limits of free speech as well as one's threshold for violence, poor taste, and literal bile. If the Confederate flag doesn't infuriate you, perhaps the pornography will. If the pornography doesn't do it, perhaps the, quote, rape issue with the limited edition rape board game, end quote, will do it. If the rape board game doesn't incite you, maybe the presence of special guest Jim Goad, convicted woman beater, will. And if none of that is enough to send you into a frenzy, Schizo, a performance artist who specializes in producing green vomit on demand, just might puke on you. If the tourist males have something in common besides a lot of tattoos, petty crime, and obscenity charges, it's a belief that working class white men have become the most despised group in America. They believe good old boys, white trash, rednecks, and hillbillies have always been oppressed by the moneyed elite. They point out that in America, white trash is the last racial epithet that is considered acceptable to say in polite company, and this indicates that racism against poor whites is just as prevalent, if not not more so as racism against black people. On top of that, they sometimes use the N-word to describe themselves. I would like you to know that I absolutely despise every word that just came out of my mouth. In 2014, this person developed a concept for an underground news show called Counterculture, which was pitched to Showtime and other networks, but not picked up by anyone. The pilot included a tour of the Ku Klux Klan Museum, interviews with Charles Manson's wife, and an interview with Carla LeVay. All the information I just told you is directly from Wikipedia, as well as Salon.com. Both Salon.com and Wikipedia are publicly available to everyone online. So that is just a little background about who we are talking about today and who is behind this book and why I feel the way I feel about everything. Also, do not buy this book. I did it so that you don't have to. Once again, this is both a critique and review of this book, and all opinions are my own. Back to this book, this cookbook. Quote, thank you for buying my cookbook. Some of these were made up when I watched my mom and grandmother cooking when I was five to seven years old. Each was a wonderful cook in their own right. In my young preteen days, everything was made from scratch and most of the vegetables were grown fresh, so a person was able to make up many recipes. So many vegetables can be blended to complement each other. When I have freedom in a kitchen, I can really put out good food. When I was in an orphanage in Ontario, California, I improved on them and spiced some up. In the late 40s, I worked at the House of Chicken in Prescott, Arizona. Then I cooked for club catering in Burlingham, California, as well as Berenstein's in San Francisco and the Ensign in San Francisco. I ran the Seahorse Restaurant at the Ferminal Hotel in San Francisco, and I also ran the restaurant at the Flame Club in Sacramento, California. I enjoy cooking and have been told by many people that my recipe 
recipes are easy to follow. One tenant, David Conant, once remarked that eating at my home was like having Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, and the 4th of July every day. Most of my recipes can be doubled or tripled so they can be frozen. Thus, if you work, they can be pulled out of the freezer, ready to heat and serve. I'm most content when cooking, and I love to cook for people who love to eat. End quote. XOXO, Dorothea Puente. The first thing about this cookbook, it's very 1980s. The font, the weird photo art at the beginning of each chapter. But the thing that is most interesting about it is that each corner of each page has little drawings on it. Drawings of ivy, bees, flowers, vines. All four corners have these little doodles. These were doodles drawn by Dorothea herself. And honestly, they're very cute for a cookbook. But hold on here. This woman is a fucking serial killer. She murdered at least nine people, the most vulnerable among us. And she's just in prison doodling flowers and bumblebees to put in her cookbook. It's wild. All I can say is, we contain multitudes, and that's terrifying. Okay, so now we're going to dive into the cookbook itself. Herbs, fresh and dried. Mexican seasoning, a blend of cumin, chili pepper, salt, onion, sweet peppers, garlic, oregano, and hot peppers. Old Bay seasoning, a medley of cassia, cardamom, mace, ginger, pimento, cloves, mustard, bay leaves, pepper, celery salt. This is good for fish and shellfish. Pizza seasoning, I use oregano, basil, fennel, garlic, onion, and others. Very specific. And others. Jamaican seasoning, salt, sugar, red pepper, onion, cinnamon, thyme, and allspice. French seasoning, chervil, parsley, chives, tarragon. Herb de Provence. Lavender, sage, fennel, basil, rosemary, marjoram, and thyme. Good for poultry and pasta dishes and salads. I fucking hate Herbe de Provence. I had never really used it. And then on accident, it ended up in my groceries by the time I got home. I think it had been sitting on the conveyor belt or something and they thought it was mine. Putting lavender on chicken for me personally is like an assault on my taste buds. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing here? You belong in my soaps and lotions and maybe in like an Earl Grey tea, not on my fucking chicken. Thank you. No, thank you. Anyways, Cajun seasoning, onion, salt, garlic, salt, black pepper, red pepper, and white pepper. Bean, mond. There are typos for sure. And under this seasoning blend, it said bean, mond. And I looked it up. It's supposed to be Beaumont. Beaumont seasoning, salt, onion, garlic, and celery salts, eggs, seafood, and vegetables. That's how it's written. I don't think the eggs, seafood, and vegetables are in the seasoning, but that's what it goes on. Barbecue, ground peppers, basil, thyme, rosemary, garlic, onion, and celery salts. Snacks and sauces, homemade spaghetti sauce, tomatoes, diced, bay leaves, onion, diced, basil, celery, diced, rosemary, olive oil, oregano, salt, sage, pepper, parsley, garlic, minced, water. Put tomatoes, onion, and celery in blender. Huh, that's not how I would do it. Bring the water to boil, then reduce heat and add blended ingredients. That is not how I would do it. Add olive oil, salt, and pepper. In a piece of cheesecloth, place bay leaves, basil, rosemary, oregano, and sage. Place in mixture and simmer three hours. Turn off heat and add parsley. What? That's a lot of parsley. Just raw? Half cup? Serve over pasta. Thank you. We didn't know that your homemade spaghetti sauce goes with pasta. My Fiesta Mexican style fruit salsa. Diced mangoes, green onions, sliced thin, apples peeled, cored, and diced, jalapenos diced, pears peeled, cored, and diced, garlic minced, cooked cranberries, honey, orange peeled and cut small, lemon or lime juice, yellow onion, diced, red vinegar. Mix well, let set in refrigerator for two hours. Serve with pork, fish, or poultry. I hate fruit salsas, like a mango salsa or a pineapple salsa. People go crazy for that shit. I don't want huge, very sweet chunks of fruit in my salsa. I want tomatoes, 
tomatillos. I want onion. I want peppers. I want hot and spicy. I don't want sweetness. But I will say this one has more types of fruit in it. Like it's very fruit heavy, which kind of makes more sense to my brain than just like chucking pineapple into a regular salsa. This is like more fruit salad vibes, but like spicy fruit salad. I kind of feel like I might like it, to be honest. Also sprinkled in to this cookbook are quotes from Dorothea. So I am going to sprinkle quotes into the episode also. Quote, I loved my people too much. Why would I spend money fattening them up if I was going to kill them? End quote. What a fucking bitch. Your people. Okay. Why would you fatten them up to get their ID, their social security number, befriend them, get their trust, and then drug and kill them? Ugh, come on. Peach and pepper salsa, chopped and peeled peaches, red bell pepper chopped, jalapeno chopped, green bell pepper chopped, garlic chopped, finely chopped Spanish onion, lime juice, finely chopped fresh cilantro, red vinegar, honey. Combine all ingredients, stir well. This is good with chicken, Cornish hens, and any other kind of fowl. Also good with lamb or liver. I wouldn't put this with liver or lamb. Well, maybe lamb. Pumpkin butter, solid packed pumpkin, nutmeg, apple juice, cloves, sugar, salt, cinnamon. Place ingredients in a saucepan. Bring to a boil, then lower heat and simmer. That sounds lit. I've never made pumpkin butter. Don't think I've seen it with like apple juice and clove. Yum. Dorothea's breadcrumbs for sweet dishes. Bread, sugar, vanilla, shredded coconut, raisins, oil. Cut bread into small pieces. In bowl, mix sugar, vanilla, coconut, raisins, and oil. Pour over breadcrumbs and dry out in oven. I was like, why do you need breadcrumbs for sweet dishes? What are you talking about? But then... That recipe sounds really good. Minus the raisins. I fucking hate raisins. They ruin everything. Oatmeal cookies, delicious. My favorite cookie. I love the taste of oatmeal. I love the earthiness. I love to add dark chocolate to add to the earthiness. Put a raisin in that bitch. I will not fucking touch it. I won't even pick them out. Not touching it. Oh, this one sounds good. Dorothea's beer snacks, refrigerated breadstick packages, garlic salt, butter or margarine melted, onion salt, sesame or poppy seeds, dry mustard, grated cheddar cheese. Gently roll each breadstick apart. Shape each rope into a pretzel or your own shape. Dick shaped. Brush each with margarine. Mix all other ingredients. Sprinkle over each shape. Bake. Good as a TV snack. A TV snack. That just reminds me of like, not that I remember them, but like the 80s with the little TV tray that you pull up and like everyone in the house has to watch one decided on program at a certain time. So everyone pulls up their little TV tray at like 6 p.m. to watch whatever show they're excited about. I can just picture it and I can picture the shag carpeting and the gross blinds and everyone like gathering for a TV snack. Soups and salads. Mexican chicken gizzard liver soup. Yum. Can't wait to make this one. That's sarcasm. Chicken gizzards. Zucchinis washed and quartered. Chicken livers. Celery ribs quartered. Potatoes peeled and quartered. Garlic minced. Onions quartered. Rice. Carrots peeled and quartered. Egg noodles. Egg noodles and rice? Girl solid packed whole tomatoes mashed wash gizzards and liver i'm out (laughs) just that one sentence no thank you i will not thank you no bring five quarts of water to a boil drop in all ingredients reduce heat simmer on low for about an hour and a half add salt black pepper bay leaf, sweet basil, fresh chopped cilantro, and a pinch of dried pepper flakes. Serve with French bread. Quote, this is so good. My great grandmother made this. Everybody from miles around used to come eat it on a Sunday afternoon. Good for the morning after from the night before. I made it for my people a lot for Sunday brunch. They loved it. End quote. I'm not showing up to a Sunday brunch or fucking dinner for that matter for gizzard and liver soup. What are you on about? No. Now, I am not trying to offend any gizzard and liver fans out there, so I guess I should explain this. I am basically a vegetarian. I was a vegetarian for 10 years. 
And then I fell off because I ate chicken strips at the fair. Anyways, they were fucking worth it. And I don't cook protein very often. If I do, it's chicken breast or steak. And so when we come to awful, I am not one to partake. I bear, I like, I can't even eat a sausage because that shit grosses me out. So if you love livers and hearts and gizzards and intestines, more power to you. I am just not that girl personally. I'm not yucking your yum. Just to clarify, I am just talking shit. Okay. Don't be mad at me. Dorothea's garbanzo bean salad. Dried garbanzo beans, minced garlic, ground pepper, minced red onion, bay leaves, lemon juice, garlic cloves, peeled, dry white wine, minced fresh thyme, fresh minced mint, olive oil. Rinse and clean garbanzo beans. Soak in water overnight. Drain and put beans in a saucepan. Add fresh water. Add the pepper, bay leaves, garlic, cloves, and thyme. Cook until the beans are tender but not mushy cool to room temperature. In a large frying pan, heat the olive oil. Add minced onion and garlic and saute. Add lemon juice and wine. Add mint. Heat until beans are heated through. Add remaining onion, salt, and pepper. Quote, I made this up too many years ago. I was 16 and married and we were having such a time eating. It's a very filling, protein-filled meal. End quote. I mean, first of all, it does sound good. I think that combination of things is classic. It sounds good. Once you add the wine and a little tiny bit of mint and some thyme, like that sounds good. And lemon and garlic. A, it's not a salad. This is a hot bean dish. This is just beans on a plate. It's definitely not a salad, but it does sound good. I would, I would try it. Berenstein's clam chowder. We're going to get to Berenstein's. Remember I mentioned it before. She said she worked there in San Francisco. And this recipe is from that restaurant. We are going to fucking dive into Berenstein's at the end as a little treat. So hold your horses. We will get there. But first, we will go over the recipe for their infamous clam chowder. Clams chopped, onions diced, cream or canned milk. What is canned milk? Condensed milk? Isn't canned milk sweet? Well, Stick with cream. Don't do canned milk. Carrots, diced, water, lemon juice or zest, potatoes, grated. Ooh, I like that. You know how it's always cubed potatoes and clam chowder? I feel like grated would be so much better because the cubes, it takes away from the clamminess. Grated is smart. That's smart. Red bell pepper, diced. Celery, diced. Green bell pepper, diced. This is a very non-traditional clam chowder with two kinds of peppers in it. That's like a Mexifornia, California, Mexico hybrid of clam chowder, I would say. But I'm sure it's delicious. Bring all ingredients to a boil, reduce heat, simmer, serve with oyster crackers. Mmm, oyster crackers. Quote, this was given to me in 1952. Berenstein's was a famous eating place in San Francisco. The front was shaped like the bow of a ship. End quote. And once again, we will get to the Berenstein's of it all. Fruit salad, dried apricots, cut. Crushed pineapple, dried apples, cut. Coconut, shredded. Do you know where we're going with this? You probably do. Dried peaches. Why are all the fruit in a fruit salad dried, though? For what? For why? Marshmallows. Mm-hmm. That's right. Dried pears. Kool-Aid. Any type. Fresh apple. Oh, now we have fresh fruit. Fresh apples peeled and diced. Mayonnaise. Bananas peeled and sliced. Sliced assorted nuts. Fucking 1950s bullshit right here. Mix well, add whipped cream if desired. Any other type of fresh or canned fruit may be added. Serve very cold. Serve all of that dried fruit with Kool-Aid and mayonnaise and marshmallows. Very cold. Otherwise, it won't be good. In the banana, once you get the mayonnaise and the banana, I am uh, horrified. Shrimp macaroni salad. I'm from the Midwest, okay? I'm not going to pretend like I don't love macaroni salad. I do. Why have I never put shrimp in it? Don't know. Does it sound good to me? Yeah, probably not to a lot of people. Well, I'm out right off the bat, though, because it's a can of shrimp drained, which obviously I would not use canned shrimp. Can of shrimp, mixed vegetables, drained, dill pickle, minced, box of macaroni and cheese, drained. Okay, I'm out. (laughs) Never mind. 
I would not make this. Um, also, it doesn't say if you're making the macaroni and cheese fully, like with the milk and the butter and the cheese, or if you're just making the macaroni and not using the cheese. It doesn't say. Sandwich spread, which is the sweet mayonnaise. What is that? Miracle Whip? I think that's what she means. So then I think you're not using the cheese sauce packet. Who knows? Can of olives diced. Mix all together, cool and serve with any type of meat and French bread. Sweet pea salad. Cans of peas, drained, save water, boiled eggs, diced, celery, minced, dill pickle, diced, onion, minced, canned diced olives, mayonnaise, or sandwich spread. Mix all ingredients together, serve on lettuce leaves. Let me think about this. Peas, eggs, celery, pickle, onion, olives, mixed with mayonnaise. Mm, I don't know. I mean, it's probably... Okay. It's basically egg salad with canned peas in it. I'm not a fan of canned vegetables, but replace it with like any other kind of pea. That would probably be pretty good. That one is hard for me to figure out. I would have to try it. Moving on to sides. Baked green tomatoes. Green tomatoes, salt, can of shrimp, drained. What? Pepper, egg, tomato sauce. What is going on here? Breadcrumbs. Core tomatoes, mash up core. Core a tomato? Peel it? How do you core a tomato? Mash up the core, mix with the rest of the ingredients, stuff tomatoes. Okay, okay, there we go. Stuff the tomatoes, wrap in foil, place in the oven, bake. Dorothea's spicy french fries, medium potatoes, each cut into eight wedges. Should we get into french fries? I will, I will talk about french fries all day, okay? Make them spicy, please. That sounds delicious. We're going to get to that. But I like crispy french fries. I do not like a soggy, limp french fry. So I usually do not like any thick cut french fries because they're too soggy and they're never like brown enough on the outside. So I like them thin. I am a shoestring girly. But I do love a wedge for sure. It has to be like well done. It has to be golden brown on every side of the wedge. Otherwise, I won't fuck with it. But anyways, back to the recipe. So potatoes cut into wedges, pepper, salt, paprika, onion, salt, garlic, salt, breadcrumbs. I will also say I love those fries that are like kind of breaded. They're so fucking good. So this actually sounds really, really good. In a small bowl, combine oregano, garlic, salt, pepper, paprika, and onion salt. Dip potato wedges into mixture and place on a greased baking sheet. Place in oven. Serve with lime wedges. Hmm. Okay. Corn, loaf, fresh corn, sliced from the cob or two cups canned, onion, minced, milk, cheddar cheese, eggs, beaten, potato, grated, small, oil, pimentos, diced, minced, olives. I've never heard of olives in corn loaf. Mix all the above ingredients together. Pour into greased loaf pan. Bake, serve hot, garnish with parsley sprigs very 80s. She loves her parsley garnish, this one. Quote, I used to cook for a hundred people three times a day. It was no bother. And when I had the restaurant, I would cook for three or four hundred at a meal. End quote. Humble brag. This is Dorothea getting her bragging pants on. Potato stuffing with kielbasa and mushroom. Potatoes peeled and cut into small pieces. Salt, chopped parsley, white pepper, fresh thyme, garlic clove, chopped chives, green onion, hot milk, shiitake or cremini mushrooms, sliced thin. Where's the kielbasa? Boiled potatoes in salted water and saute garlic and shallots. There's no shallots on that list. Or garlic. (laughs) But okay. Add mushroom stirring, add kielbasa and herbs. Drain potatoes and return to pan. Then mash with milk and butter. Add potatoes to kielbasa, season with salt and pepper. I mean, yeah, that's going to be delicious. It's not potato stuffing. It's mashed potatoes with kielbasa and sautéed mushrooms. Who wouldn't like that? Dorothea's seafood rice. Cooked long grain rice. Minced clams. Canned clams. Can you imagine? Minced onion, canned smoked oysters, minced celery, canned large shrimp or cooked shrimp, diced red pimentos, diced green pimentos, onion soup, okay, minced or sliced olives. So this is just canned seafood with olives and pimentos and onion soup. Uh, That sounds horrifying to me. Mix all ingredients well, then add paprika, salt and pepper, garlic salt, and cilantro. Serve with a Waldorf salad and French buns. 
That sounds gross. Dorothea's orange glazed potatoes, yams or sweet potatoes, orange juice, cornstarch, orange marmalade, salt, butter, packed brown sugar, pecan halves. Scrub and trim potatoes, place in a large pot and bring to a boil, simmer until tender, cool, peel, and slice on a slant. In a saucepan, combine the cornstarch, salt, and brown sugar. Stir. Then add the orange juice and orange marmalade. Mix well and stir while heating. Remove from heat and add the butter and pecan halves. Ladle over potatoes and bake uncovered. Also use one half package of marshmallows on top. I mean a classic Thanksgiving dish, really. Quote, I made this up myself around 1952. No, you didn't, you fucking liar. Everybody, newsflash, Dorothea Puente invented Thanksgiving. I wanted something different because I was tired of the same old standard. Sometimes I would put brandy on it for my tenants, end quote. That's a great idea. I would add the brandy, though, to the brown sugar mix, not just like pour brandy on top of it without cooking it. Main courses. Dorothea's homemade tamales. Apparently her tamales were the shit. People fucking loved her tamales. It's a lot of work to make tamales, but they are delicious. Maza. Bay leaf, shortening, I like Crisco, she said that, not me, oregano, salt, chili powder, coriander, water that meat has been cooked in. That is some shit from like the old school cookbooks. I collect vintage cookbooks. They are hilarious and horrifying and amazing. In the vintage cookbooks, they will say some shit that you're like supposed to know what it means. Water that meat has been cooked in is all that it says. That's what this recipe calls for. So get out your meat water and get to cooking, okay? All right, pepper flakes, flour, celery, onion, minced fine, sliced pitted black olives. Put black olives in your tamales? This bitch loves a can of olives, and I do too, but she puts them in things I would not put them in. Also, you're gonna need corn husks, filling, long red dried chilies, pork roast broiled in water to which the following has been added. Okay. This is going to be your meat water. All of that. And it was right here in front of me. Don't throw that meat water away, okay? You're going to need it. So you're going to boil the pork roast in water, and you're going to put the chilies in a blender with meat water. You're going to soften the corn husk in hot water from the meat and open. So you have to soak the corn husk in the meat water too. When meat has cooled, pull apart. Mix olives, celery, onion, chili, and spices. Spread out corn husks and mix the corn maza, flour, salt, crisco, and meat water. And spread on husks. Add as much meat mixture as you wish according to the size of the tamales you wish. You may use beef or chicken also. My favorite are queso and roasted poblano pepper. Bring water to a boil. Place a colander in the middle of the pan. Stack the tamales evenly around the colander. Simmer with lid propped on. Good eating was her only note. Good eating. Fun sidebar. She also included her prison recipe for tamales in the cookbook because I guess she had made them in prison a lot. Don't get too excited. You don't make them in a toilet. It's basically the same thing, but with saran wrap instead of corn husk. Dorothea's spicy mango ham steak, red wine vinegar, salt and pepper, brown sugar, virgin olive oil, fresh ginger minced ham steak, one inch thick, mango peeled, seeded and sliced, jalapeno minced. In medium saucepan over medium heat, combine vinegar, sugar, jalapeno, and ginger. Cook until thick and caramelized. Let cool to room temperature. In blender, puree the mango. Pour the mango into the bowl with the rest of the ingredients. Brush with olive oil and season with salt and pepper. I'm assuming she means the meat. Grill the steak until golden brown and brush with glaze. Once again, I don't need fruit in my meat. Vegetarian lentil loaf. Now we're talking. Cooked mashed lentils, garlic salt, eggs well beaten, oil, breadcrumbs, onion minced, salt, celery minced, pepper, canned tomato sauce. I feel like it needs a lot more shit than that. Mix all ingredients well. Pour into a greased loaf pan and bake. Quote, my sister-in-law was a vegetarian. I have lots of friends that are vegetarian. You can take the nuts or the vegetables out and add meat with the lentils. It becomes really tasty. End quote. So she's she's like, this recipe is really good. Um, if you take out the vegetables and the nuts and then you add a bunch of meat to it, it's really tasty. 
Brandy baked chicken, chicken, black pepper, teriyaki sauce, salt, honey or syrup, dried mustard, brandy, cilantro, ginger. Wash chicken and pat dry. Place one cup oil, fry chicken. So you fry it and then bake it. If you thought it was healthy because it was baked, you're wrong. In baking dish, mix teriyaki sauce, honey, brandy, ginger, pepper, salt, and mustard. Pour over chicken. Bake. Oh, this one sounds delicious. Chicken gizzards, hearts, and livers. Mixed gizzards, hearts, and livers. Salt, black pepper, milk, onions, eggs, beaten, celery, flour, carrot, grated. Bring water, salt, and pepper to boil. Drop in chicken part. (laughs) Chicken part. Simmer. Beat eggs and milk together. Place chicken parts in egg mixture, then flour. Grease a baking pan. Place chicken parts and drop onions, celery, and carrots over them. Mix cold water and remaining flour in egg mixture. Bake. I'm so confused. You're going to boil all of the chicken part, and then you're going to do a double dip batter with the eggs and milk and then followed by the flour. But then you put them on a pan, drop raw vegetables on top of it, and then put water and flour and egg mixture over top of that and then bake it. Like, what the fuck is happening? Quote, when I ran the Seahorse restaurant in the Terminal Hotel on Lower Market Street, I had to cook for the international scene. Oh, the bragging pants came back on. It catered to merchant marines, ferry building workers, longshoremen, attorneys, and warehouse people. So we always had food that was ready in a short time as their lunch, breakfast, and dinner were at all hours. They had people from all over the world, Europe, Asia, Central, and South America. So each meal was an international flavor. End quote. I don't fucking believe you. She thinks she's so fancy. You know, the international scene, the warehouse workers. Okay. My favorite grilled pork tenderloin. Pork tenderloin, dry white wine, oil, minced fresh tarragon, butter, cream, Dijon mustard, gherkins, sliced thin, minced leeks, yum, salt and pepper to taste. One package, dry white gravy mix. Brush tenderloin with oil and grill. Cream, butter, and mustard. Set aside in a small pan. Combine leeks, wine, and tarragon. Heat until reduced. Lower heat and add cream and gherkins. Cook, then add mustard mixture. Season with salt and pepper. This is good. Served with pea salad and new potatoes. I mean, yeah, that's gonna be good. All of that goes together. Oh, what do you do with the gravy mix? She left that part out. Doesn't say. That's gonna be delicious. Dorothea's oyster loaf, breadcrumbs, tomato sauce, eggs, beaten, oysters, sliced, onion, diced, lemon juice, olive oil, salt, celery, diced, carrot, grated, dry pepper. Mix tomato sauce, dry mustard, salt, and pepper. Add eggs while beaten, onions, celery, carrots, breadcrumbs, and oil. Mix in oysters. Pour into loaf pan. Sprinkle grated cheese over top. Bake. Ugh, no. This one is all the no. Quote, a captain out of San Francisco, Captain Eddie Gray, came into Bernstein's, a restaurant I was working at in San Francisco. He wanted an oyster loaf, and that night I made a couple at home and took them to work the next day. That is illegal, but okay. He came in and loved it. It became an everyday item on the menu. End quote. Gross. Also, she's such a fucking liar. I feel like that whole story's a lie. Veggie burgers. Yum. Water, Munster or Jack cheese, grated. Regular oats, onions, grated. Cornmeal, carrots, grated. Egg, almonds, chopped. Fresh dill, finely chopped. Walnuts, chopped. Garlic, minced. Parsley, finely chopped. Cottage cheese. Bring water to a boil. Add oats and remove from burner. Mix thoroughly, then add all other ingredients in a large bowl and mix well. Portion patties to about six ounces each. Cook in saute pan using butter. Cook until firm. I would try that. It's fine with oats. Definitely add a lot of nuts, a lot of different kinds of vegetables. This has got some cheese, some dill, some garlic, cornmeal. I feel like that would be good. I've never made them with cottage cheese or had them with cottage cheese, but I mean, I think it'd be pretty good. Desserts. Dorothea's bread, nut, and fruit pudding, breadcrumbs, minced prunes, egg well beaten, apple, diced, sugar, allspice, chopped nuts, any type, nutmeg, raisins, milk, vanilla, or almond flavoring. Mix well, pour into loaf pan, 
bake. Spice and pumpkin muffins. Yum. Flour, allspice, granulated sugar, cinnamon, baking powder, solid packed pumpkin, baking soda, buttermilk or yogurt, salt, egg, beaten, nutmeg, oil or butter. Grease a 12 cup muffin tin and line with paper baking cups. In a bowl, beat eggs, yogurt, and pumpkin. Then add the rest of the dry items. Mix well and pour into baking cups. Bake. That sounds delicious, and I'm sure they are. Pumpkin ginger pudding. Dorothea, who knew? Serial killer Dorothea Puente was the fucking original fall girl. Pumpkin spice autumnal bitch. Who knew? Pumpkin ginger pudding. Eggs, egg yolks, solid packed pumpkin, milk, ginger, heavy cream, ground nutmeg, sugar, vanilla. In a medium bowl, beat eggs and egg yolks, then beat in cream, milk, sugar, vanilla, ginger, and nutmeg. Add pumpkin and blend well. Arrange six custard cups or ramekins in a large baking pan. Pour mixture evenly over the custard cups. Set in center of oven. Pour water into pan until it reaches halfway up. Cover with foil and bake. Let cool. Set in refrigerator at least three hours overnight. Ugh, that sounds fucking good. I bet that shit is good. Mom's fried apples, butter or margarine, unpeeled, tart red apples, sliced, sugar, ground cinnamon, melt butter in large skillet, add apples and sugar, stir to mix well, cook and stir over medium heat for 10 minutes. I don't think you can go wrong with that. My mom's honey cookies, honey, baking soda, shortening, cinnamon, flour, cloves. Place honey, shortening, soda, cinnamon, and cloves in a large bowl and cream together. Mix well. I use my hands as mixture is thick. Cut into any cookie cutter you wish, then sprinkle with powdered sugar. This was given to me by my grandmother in 1947 in California. Quote, these are so good. I learned how to make these when I was about 10 years old. My mother was such a fantastic cook. End quote. Those sound amazing. I've never had a honey cookie in my life, but now I want one. That is all for recipes. Overall, I would say some of them sound really good. A lot of them sound like a 1950s disaster. All of them can be found in better versions online by someone else. That is my general overview. Also, cooking technique wise, nothing special going on here. Dorothea was not reinventing the wheel. Now, we have to talk about the end of this book, this cookbook, which is an interview. It is a fucking shit show. So fanboy, if you think back to the beginning, remember pen pal Shane? He did a big, long interview with Dorothea for this cookbook. Shane is telling Dorothea he believes that she didn't commit the murders. Shane is also sending her stamps and books and adding cash to her commissary. Just so we all know what this relationship really is. Once a manipulator and a scam artist, always a manipulator and a scam artist, and it seems to me that Shane fell for it, or decided it was worth it to get his cookbook written. Because as it turns out, Shane is a little bit of a fucking grifter also. But he, am I allowed to say that word? I think I am, right? God only knows what's going on in this dude's mind. Don't know. Couldn't tell you. Don't really care. So out of this interview, I'm going to cherry pick the interesting tidbits and feed them to you. That was gross, but you get what I'm trying to say. There is a lot of the usual. It's Dorothea complaining about prison, how long it takes to get mail, the phone interruptions by the jail staff, her lawyers suck, her appeals won't go through. Woe is me, all of that bullshit we always hear from murderers behind bars. She is griping away, being a little bitch. I'm cutting all of that and just adding a few little things that might give us any insight into Dorothea or her life. And there are some in here that are pretty interesting. Dorothea, quote, I read historical romance or westerns, end quote. That I included because it was funny to me. Shane is providing Dorothea with everything she wants, money in her commissary, bringing her food, bringing her blah, 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 doing all the shit. And he was asking her about books. And she was like, I don't like the book that you got me. And he was like, what do you read? And she was like, I only read historical romance. What? Or westerns. Bizarre. Bizarre choices, especially when you have all that time in jail. I don't know, man. It was weird to me. Shane, quote, 
how do you screen print the greeting cards that you've been sending? She sends a fucking lot of greeting cards to people. She loves a greeting card situation. Dorothea, quote, most of it's done with wax, floor wax, and felt pens and fingernail polish, clear fingernail polish. I do that in my room. I work nights, so I can't use the art place. Anything I do, I have to do in my cell. Okay, see, like, in the streets, we used to do ceramics and a lot of crochet and make quilts and things, but here I don't have the funds because I have to pay restitution, and it really just screws up everything, end quote. In the streets, you were doing ceramics and crochet? What the fuck are you talking about? Also, every single question he asks her comes back to money and how she needs money, just like this one. She doesn't have the funds to make more greeting cards. Just throwing it in there to try to get what she can get, as she has done her entire life. But also, like, her paying restitution of all the money she stole from people that she murdered, and she still has the audacity to be like, but I need art supplies. And it really just screws everything up when I have to pay restitution to the families of people I murdered. And you're going to bitch about that? In an interview, you know it's going to be published. This bitch does not give a fuck about anyone, clearly. Shane, quote, do you have a lot of visitors? Dorothea, quote, I only let my daughter come once a year, but she doesn't do much for me anyhow. In fact, she does very little for me. Her books got sent back one time and she bitched about that. And now she won't send me books. But um, she's old, too. She's going to be 54 this year, end quote. She is so mean. I only let her come once a year, and she doesn't do enough for me. And when she does try, it got sent back, and she's old. This is from her mother. What the fuck are you talking about? Also, like, you're 90. Shut up. She's so rude and does not care. Even when people do nice things for her, she's a bitch. Ugh, I hate this woman. LOL, you're dead now. Ha ha. Hold up a second. I do not know why this dude published this interview. It's literally just her bitching and him trying to wheedle recipes from her. Like, desperately trying to get the recipes out of her. And the two of them are, like, wheeling and dealing about the cookbook. Like, it's a fucking billion dollar deal that they have on the table. Very scummy, all of it. You're small fucking potatoes. What are you doing here? This is a very long interview that goes on for, like, weeks. And it's just the same conversation over and over of one con trying to out-con the other alleged con. All of that being said, one of the key points is he wants that fucking tamale recipe. He wants it. He heard over and over and over again about these tamales and he wants that goddamn recipe and she is holding out and she will only send him desserts. And he's like, yeah, thanks. But about those tamales. And she's like, oh, I can't. I can't. I'm too busy. I can't get it to you right now. (laughs) <laughs> it's just so funny. Then they start talking about selling mugs and t-shirts of her face. I'm not even kidding you. Then, and get this shit, Shane starts bragging to Dorothea that he was the one who was selling the paintings that John Wayne Gacy did, that he was like his broker to sell the paintings for John Wayne Gacy. And he is telling Dorothea how they had an assembly line of paintings going out of Gacy's jail cell. So this dude tries to make money off of selling murder merch. And I mean, I bought this book. I'm also upset because I'm like, what if what if Shane got my $4? Dorothea, quote, If you make money, fine. I can understand that. Somebody in San Francisco wanted permission to make cups and things like that with my picture on it. Shane, quote, what? Dorothea, quote, cups and t-shirts like Charles Manson and all them. But I don't want to go with just anybody. I'll send you a picture that was taken here. I have on a long moo-moo type thing, but I'm squatting down. So I'll send you one of them for a t-shirt or a coffee cup. End quote. Shane, quote, Yeah, I'd like to do all that stuff like you're talking about with the cups and such. I can't wait to get this book done. Then Shane keeps bringing up the cards that she makes, the greeting cards. Quote, are these cards made only by you or do the other girls in there make that stuff? Dorothea, quote, oh no, I make my own. Shane, quote, okay. Dorothea, quote, I never put my name on anything and I always sign my name either on the back and then also someplace on the picture. Oh no, I would never use someone else's work. That's plagiarism. If they're ever going to be displayed, I would get into a lot of trouble. End quote. Shane, quote, 
I suppose. You know, I sold some paintings from Gacy, and after a while, he became so popular, he had a whole assembly line going on there. End quote. So that is his humble brag about Gacy. Also, I love that Dorothea is so worried about A, she thinks her cards are going to be displayed where a museum. Also that she's so worried about plagiarism of greeting cards when you murdered nine people. But how, how, how does the brain work? What is happening in her head? I don't get it. Shane, quote, so you're pretty infamous, huh? Dorothea, quote, yeah, and they know me from the newspapers and then TV, and most of them are afraid to be in my room until they meet me, and then we get pretty close. Shane, so you're real famous, huh? Dorothea, yeah, I can't wait for you to come and visit me, end quote. Ugh. Then there is more haggling about the book, more haggling about money, about lawyers and press and media, who in prison and the press will get a free copy of the cookbook. Paints him in a horrible light, though, and her too, but hers was already horrible. A quote that I loved from Dorothea, quote, I like sexy books, end quote. Do you, Dorothea? <laughs> Do you like sexy books? You're a weirdo. Shane, quote, how did you get into the care business, Dorothea? Dorothea, quote, from my mom when I was five or six years old. What, she liked to care for people? No, I cared for her. I have a brother who's a millionaire and I have a sister who's a school teacher. I have a brother who's an ex-constable. Did they talk to you at all? No, I ruined their lives. Why would you say that? Because they were all harassed by the press, all of them. So the press went after everyone. Yeah, my daughter too. That's why she won't speak to anybody. Does your daughter still talk to you? I don't call her. I haven't called her on the phone since I've been arrested. You only have one daughter? Yes. And that's the only kids you have? No, I had four, but the others are dead. One died since I've been here and my twins committed suicide. Both of them did? Yes, within hours of each other, not knowing the other one had done it. They were in Oregon. They were born on Halloween. They did that because of your sentence? Yeah, one was married to a chief of police, one was married to a DA up there, so they couldn't face the shame, you know? How old were your twins when they passed away? 47. Was their last name Puente? No. No wonder I couldn't find anything about it on the internet. It wasn't even in the book. End quote. So this conversation is interesting to me for several reasons, mainly because it reeks of pathological lying. And I find that interesting. So let us unpack this. Cannot confirm that she has a brother who's a millionaire. Okay, then why are you scamming people? Her sister might be a school teacher. I don't know. And then she has another brother who's a constable. Okay, and then <laughs> she doesn't speak to her daughter since she got arrested when she said that she does. And she tried to send her books, right? We just talked about that. Now she's saying, oh, no, I've never talked to her. Obviously, that relationship is not good, but you can't keep your lies straight, which means you're not a very good liar. Then um, just so dismissive of like, mm, I don't call her. She literally says, I don't call her. So rude and dismissive and cold. Then she's very cold saying, no, I had four kids, but the others are dead. They're just dead. No big deal. I don't know. She said one died since she'd been in jail. And the twins born on Halloween that committed suicide with at the same time in different places that were married to a chief of police and a DA. Not one single thing about that anywhere. Cannot find, cannot confirm that. Probably not true, to be honest with you. I do find it interesting. Shane was asking, how old were they? What was their last name? Oh, I, I, no wonder I couldn't find anything out about it. Those are things I would have been prying for too, just because I would want to know if she's lying and I'd want to go look it up. Clearly, he was trying to get a little more information. Then the comment, it wasn't even in the book. So during this hot mess of an interview, they discuss this book often and with hatred. Dorothea loves to say that everything in that book was a lie. It is a book about her life, Dorothea's life, and Dorothea's crimes. It's a true crime book. I don't know who it's by. I don't know exactly which one it is, but she is pissed about it. And she is saying the author lied about a bunch of stuff. I highly doubt the author lied about anything. I think she just doesn't like being portrayed as the shitty person that she is. And then Shane is just like, trying to get these recipes, trying to get them dollars, them greeting cards. He's just like on her side with everything. 
So he's always like, yeah, that fucking book. Just agreeing with her. I also love how she blames the press for ruining her family's lives. Like, no, sweetheart, you did that all on your own. Moving on to the next little bit. So Shane says, quote, what do you think your most requested dishes were when you had the boarding houses? What did people really get off on? End quote. Gross way to phrase that. Dorothea, quote, steak and chicken. And then I made a lot of Chinese food and I've cooked a lot of Armenian food. End quote. I just want to know where those recipes are. Where's your Chinese food? Where's your Armenian food? Hmm? Where? Show me. I don't believe you. Then after that, Shane circles right back to the twins, which I'm stuck on the twins too. This is the only time I feel him. And he says, what were your twins' names? And Dorothea says, I don't want to put their names out, really. End quote. She won't say even what their names are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then Shane says, if I ask you for something, you should answer it. And if you don't want it out there, we're not going to put it out there. I'm going to try to urge these people to be a little more sympathetic. Dorothea, it hurts their family. I'm trying to get reunited and think about logical things. Shane, you are? Dorothea, yes. And right now it's really hard. End quote. So he's saying like, if we put it out in the public about your twins committing suicide, that's more sympathy for you. And she's saying it hurts their family, which is your family. But you're trying to get reunited with whom? Your dead children? Their spouses? Certainly not your one confirmed alive daughter. You don't give a shit about her. Also think about logical things. What does that even mean? It's a throwaway answer because she does not have two dead twins it's not a thing, and they don't have husbands. So yeah, I guess it's not that logical to think about your fake dead children and their fake families. What are you talking about? And of course, it's really hard. Everything's so hard for her. She's got it so hard. Dorothea, quote, I got the ballerina stamps. I love them because I like dancing, you know? That was my first really hard job outside of working at a restaurant when I was 15. End quote. Shane, quote, dancing? Dorothea, yeah. I was on the stage. Shane, you were a rock set, right? Dorothea, yeah, from 1948 to 1954. Shane, wow, what is a rock set? End quote. I'm interjecting. They're saying, she's saying she was a rock set. It's a rock hat. They're not even saying it right. She's not even saying it right. But okay, so he's like, what is a rock set? Uh, Dorothea says, a dancer in Radio City Music Hall. Shane, I knew they were famous. I just didn't know what they did necessarily. Did you get paid a lot when you were a dancer? Dorothea, yeah. I had a suite at the Pierre Hotel on 11th Avenue in New York and commuted back and forth from San Francisco to New York. Shane, so you were a famous dancer. Dorothea, no, I would have been. Shane, why weren't you? Dorothea, because you have to work your way up, and when I was ready to become second, I got knocked off the stage. Shane, by who? Dorothea, one of the girls fell into me and knocked me off the stage. Shane, what happened? You broke a leg or something? Dorothea, I hurt my back real bad. End quote. I cannot confirm any of this. You are even saying the word wrong, Rockette. Also, they don't get paid a lot, and you definitely don't get put up in a suite at the Pierre Hotel and shuttled back and forth across the country from San Francisco to New York. Sorry, none of that shit is true. And it ended in tragedy with her being shoved off the stage. Like, what is this? Showgirls? Did you just steal the plot of Showgirls and add it to your biography? I can't with her. That is all I picked out of that hot mess of an interview. At the end of the cookbook, there are photos of letters sent between the two of them. There's some of her artwork that she drew and jewelry that she made. There's some poems that she wrote that she had sent all of that stuff to Shane. I wanted to read you. Get ready. A couple of poems. That's right. This one is called The Person by Dorothea Puente. You are the person I want to sew into the fabric of my life. You are the person I want to share and unwind with each day. You are the person I want to share and have beside me. The person I want to have new discoveries with. You are the best thing that ever happened to me. You are the person that is the most beautiful and important part of me. You give me hope at the end of the hectic day. You make me believe in myself and give me hope for a future. Someone I can tell my troubles to. The person I never tire of having next to me. You are my future. Who are you talking about? What future do you have? You're going to die in prison and you know that. Or is this 
a move? Does she think that Shane's going to think it is about him? And he's going to like do more for her and give her more money? I mean, besides ringing very shallow, I don't think she has feelings for anyone. So in my head, she thinks there's a con going. And this is a part of it. That's what I think. She is conning someone. And if it's not Shane, it's probably someone else. Remember, she hooked a guy while she was in prison for fraud or whatever, theft. And she got a guy to move into her house and come pick her up at jail. I think it's one of those. And I think she's probably asking him for money. This one is actually kind of funny. This is the best one. This one is called Senior Citizens. Senior Citizens are the nation's leading carriers of AIDS, hearing aids, band-aids, roll aids, walking aids, medical aids, government aid, and most of all, monetary aids to their children. The golden years have come at last. I cannot see. I cannot pee. I cannot chew. I cannot screw. My memory shrinks. My hearing stinks. No sense of smell. I look like hell. My body's drooping. Got trouble pooping. So the golden years have come at last. Well, the golden years can kiss my question mark. I hate to give her any props, but that's pretty fucking funny. And to wrap up this episode, get ready. We're not doing animals. They're fucking cool. We are going to dive into the Bernstein's restaurant that Dorothea was so fucking proud of working at. And honestly, it's delightful and it's a fucking treat. So here we go. Bernstein's, San Francisco. Its full name is Bernstein's Fish Grotto. Fuck yeah. Love that. It used to be at 123 Powell Street and its logo is a mermaid. There is a big storefront situation on this street with shops on either side of it. There's a big cutout of the wall, of this like brick wall, this huge, it almost looks like a huge garage inside of this garage parked inside sticking out of the garage is a ship, a full sea ship. Well, made to look like one. It's not a real ship. It's sticking out. There's a mermaid on the front at the bow. There is another, it looks like a smaller boat to the left of it. And they're hooked together with docking rope. And there are portals. There is lots of intricate gilding on the underside of the bow. It looks really fucking cool. I'm not going to lie. The inside of Bernstein's Fish Grotto. So it's a drawing of it, but it's called the Cabin Dining Room and Bar. You're inside a boat. It's a dining room inside of a cruise ship. And it has an upper deck with life preservers hanging off of it. It looks like there's seating up top and then a big dining room. At the bottom, there are portal windows all around the top of the dining area. There's ropes with flags hanging down off the ceiling. Yeah, it looks like you're sitting inside a giant ship. Of course, all of this I will put on social media. A little history, Bernstein's Fish Grotto was opened by Maurice Bernstein in 1907. It was known for its unique entrance, a ship's bow jutting into the sidewalk. The ship was a faithful reproduction of Christopher Columbus's ship, Nina. Inside the restaurant, the marine theme continued. Berenstein's had seven colorful dining rooms, the Fisherman's Cave, the Pilot Room, the Sun Deck, the Main Salon, the Cabin Nooks, the Upper Deck, and the Portal Counter. Oh, there is a little counter. Maybe it's like a coat check or a bar? Not sure. Located near the end of Powell Cable Car Line, the grotto was a popular tourist attraction for many years. Advertising called it the ship that never sailed. Despite the fact that the restaurant never saw the sea, they did serve fresh fish and a number of signature dishes. Maurice Bernstein was an Oakland fish merchant who ran a number of eateries in the Bay Area. The fish grotto served three dishes found nowhere else in the city. Abalone steaks, mussels bordelais, and cuckoo clams from the Cuckoo Cove. Bernstein's fish grotto closed in 1981. In 1988, the owners of the Mermaid Seafood Bar opened across the street. Michael H. Casey Designs was asked to make a mold of the original Bernsteins and repair the original, like the the ship front. She sat outside for many years with a plaque that read, We dedicate the opening of the Mermaid Seafood Bar at the Hotel Union Square with this mermaid whose journey began across the street at Bernstein's Fish Grotto in 1907. Oh, I see. My bad. So the replica... And the restoration were not on the whole ship front, but on the mermaid that was at the bow of the ship. So just the mermaid. 
Though she has lain dormant for many years, she is again ready to lift the spirits of those who sight her and welcome them for a respite from the sidewalk seas. May she again shine like a beacon in this city's future, as well as illuminate the memories of her past. February 1989. The restaurant has since closed, and nobody has any idea where the original went, but we hope a copy graces someone's backyard. I wish they would bring this back. The front of the menu. Oh yeah, we're going over the entire menu. That's right. It's a fishing rod with all these cute little fish and a lobster and a bunch of fishing lines. And then there's a merman. Ooh, zaddy. Ooh, he's got the the penis V going. Very hot. Uh, There's a beautiful topless mermaid with red hair and great boobs. And then there's a picture of the outside of the fish grotto. Oh, there's a ship on either side. There's also one on the right, like a smaller one. I don't know if it's supposed to be a ship or a dock. (gasps) It's the dock. So the little things on each side are, it's supposed to look like the ends of the dock. And then there's a door going in. So you don't enter. Oh, there's a door in the ship too. Two entrances. There's a big entrance in the front and a tiny little door in the side of the ship. And then it's docked. That's why those docking lines are tied to either side. Okay, now we know. It's it's a dock. There's a picture of the inside on the front of the menu also. Very, very cool looking. Not the main inside the ship view of that seating area, but it's another one. It's down a flight of steps. If you were to come down off the ship, there's another dining area. And then it looks like to the side of the ship and they made the ceiling look like a sky and then there's more like nautical ropes coming off of the ship this is a huge restaurant huge also did dorothea really work there she brings it up a lot a she could have never been there in her life b she did go there a lot and loved it so she said she worked there c maybe it was just like the most popular restaurant of her day when she lived there. So she decided she was going to tell everyone that she was the head chef who made up the oyster loaf recipe. Who knows if any of that is even true, to be honest. But this restaurant is iconic nonetheless. Oh, real quick, I want to shout out this website because... It is preserving so much rich information. This is the official Culinary Institute of America's website. They have a digital collection of old menus. And you can pick the decade starting at 1910 and see the menus. And then you can break it down by like types of food, drink lists, wine, break it down by city, state, country. I mean, talk about doing God's work, right? So they do banquets and parties, of course. Cocktails, exclusive to Bernstein's, they say. The cuckoo clam cocktail. Oh, these are not drinks. <laughs> these are seafood cocktails. So you can get a clam cocktail, oyster, crab, shrimp, or fruit cocktail. This is expensive. $40 for a shrimp cocktail? I'm confused. Yeah, $40. I don't know. It must not be dollars. I don't know because it says the fruit cocktail is 35. There's no other marking. It's just a number. 35? 35 what? Cents? No. There's no decimal. Don't know. It's a mystery. You can also get a cuckoo clam juice cocktail. Sounds horrifying. You can also get a jumbo seafood cocktail for 50 question mark. Ooh, lobster cocktail. Calavo cocktail. Avocado. I live in California and I didn't know, but calavo is avocado. Yum. That's 45. 45 what? I'm so confused. Okay, moving on to appetizers. You can get marinated olives, cuckoo clams on the half shell, imported anchovies, caviar, giant ripe olives, celery branch. Ew, who would order a celery branch for an appetizer? Oh, people in the 80s that were on diet pills, aka speed. Pickled beets, green onions or radishes. What? That's an appetizer. Large green olives, more caviar. You can either get domestic or imported. Celery roquefort, stuffed olives, sliced onions or tomato juice. Next up is types of seafood. So you can get abalone if it's in season, which is March 15th to January 15th. You can get abalone supreme dipped in yolk for 75 something. Abalone steak with tartar sauce, broiled with bacon, deviled and shell, sauteed with spinach, a la Newburgh. Oh, so you can get lobster Newburgh. This is abalone Newburgh. It is an American seafood dish made from seafood, butter, cream, cognac, sherry, eggs, and cayenne pepper. Okay, so it's like a spicy, buttery, creamy sauce, but it's brown because it has sherry and cognac. Sign me up. I would try that. 
You can get abalone with curry and rice and chutney, abalone patties, abalone bordelaise, which bordelaise is a classic French sauce named after the Bordeaux region of France. It's a red wine sauce with bone marrow, butter, and shallots. Normally served with steak. You can get it plain broiled or you could get it poulette. Let's look that up. Poulette, it says, is a velote with added egg yolk. It is a cream sauce with mushrooms, parsley, and lemon juice. Scallops, you can get fried with tartar sauce. You can get Creole, sautéed with mushrooms, with bacon, or a simple sauté. Shrimp, or Louisiana prawns, any style. You can get them in shell with rice and curry and chutney. You can get them shelled. You can get them with mayonnaise, creamed on toast, Creole, a la Newberg, and casserole. Delmonico. It says Delmonico is a type of steak. It keeps coming back to Delmonico's restaurant and the sauce that they make for their steak. I'm guessing it's that. It's like it's some kind of steak sauce that I'm not sure why you'd want it on fish, but maybe that'd be good on shrimp. I could see it. Crabs, you can get from November 15th to July 30th. You can get a whole cracked crab for 95 question marks. Deviled in shell, crab leg sautéed, half cracked, or just the legs Newberg style. <gasps> oh my god. I just cracked the pricing mystery. It says the crab legs are $1.25. That means all of these other prices are indeed in cents. 80 cents, 70 cents for like a scallop or a shrimp or whatever. But a crab leg is $1.25. Okay, I'm so glad we figured that out because that was driving me crazy. You can get just the crab meat and you can get it Newberg and casserole, Marine and casserole, Delmonico, creamed, a la king, Maryland casserole in an omelet, in a gratin. You can get picked crab meat for 80 cents. You can get it with curry, rice, and chutney, Creole with rice, patties, Newberg, a dollar and ten cents. Picked crab legs are a dollar. Crab legs, O'Brien, a dollar fifty. O'Brien is with peppers and onions. You can get frog legs, plain fried, or with fresh mushrooms, or in a poulette. Those are like a dollar and ten cents each. Lobsters, daily arrival. Newberg, Delmonico, creamed or a la king, a dollar twenty three. You can get lobster princess. I don't know. This just brings up Princess Cruises. If you can get lobster, that's all I can find on Lobster Princess. You can get salt and smoked fish steamed with a boiled potato for 75 cents, creamed Alaska cod, marinated herring with potato salad for 40 cents, salt mackerel, broiled or steamed, smoked black Alaskan cod, yum, broiled or steamed with potatoes, imported Bismarck herring with potato salad. You can get your salted smoked fish Delmonico or broiled also. There is a five cent charge for bread and butter when only soup is served. Ooh, they carry brands of imported and domestic cigars and cigarettes for your meal as well. Oh, we know what the portal is. Remember the portal counter that I was like, maybe it's a Coke counter. That's the to-go counter. If you want to-go food, you go to the portal. Also, they have abalone souvenirs for sale at the portal. Are you fucking kidding me? bring this place back after having oysters and lobster and God knows what else and martinis and champagne cocktails. I absolutely want more food to go and I absolutely want abalone souvenirs. I will buy all of that shit. I want everything. A beer is 60 cents, by the way. Amazing. So cuckoo clams are like their specialty. It takes up a huge portion of the menu. There's a big illustration and you can get them on the half shell in a cocktail, fritters, steamed, roasted, etc. And it says opened while you wait. It also says cuckoo clams are obtained only at Bernstein's Fish Grottoes. They're in season September 1st to June 1st, direct from their own beds. That's amazing. You can get the cuckoo clams on the half shell, fancy pepper roast, Pepper roast, pan roast, stewed, steamed, bordelaise, fried, imperial shell roast, deep shell roast, Newberg, fritters, steamed with rice, curry or Spanish, hangtown fry. And it's like 35 cents to 90 cents. 
each. The captain's special is called Fruits of the Sea, and that's one dollar. I don't know what that is really, but you can get oysters. They're opened while you wait. They're fresh every day. You can get them imperial deep shell roast, fry or pan roasted on the half shell, creamed stew, milk stew, broiled escalloped Rockefeller, fancy pepper roast, raw on plate, patties, pepper roast, Kirkpatrick omelet, or hangtown. And they're 60 cents to a dollar, depending on how you want them made. Oh, it seems to be. So oysters, Kirkpatrick, it's also called Kilpatrick. They're very popular in Australia, but it was coined first in San Francisco as Kirkpatrick. And they're topped with bacon and Worcestershire sauce and Tabasco. Yum. Delicious. I'm a mignonette girl, but I also love a little horseradish on there and lemon juice too. I'll try anything. Rockefeller is delicious also. I'm sure Kirkpatrick is delicious. Normally, I'm a standard mignonette. Should we look up Hangtown? Oh, Hangtown Fry is with eggs. It's fried oysters in an omelet or fried in with eggs. Lish. You can get Olympia oysters in all those same ways, including a la Creole. Soups. Under soups, it says original shell service. So it's served in a shell, I guess. That You can get the Bernstein's famous clam chowder, lobster bisque, cream of abalone, Boston fish chowder, mock turtle, ooh, or clam broth. As for salads, you can get a stuffed tomato stuffed with either crab or shrimp, 35 cents, hearts of lettuce with anchovies, half an avocado with French dressing, giant white asparagus salad, hearts of artichoke, lettuce and tomato, lobster louis for 80 cents, lettuce with egg, lobster rosalie, I don't exactly see lobster rosalie, but it seems to be like lobster, avocado, and a citrus vinaigrette from what I can deduce. You can get a salad that just says combination. Don't know what that means. Uh, You can get pineapple and cottage cheese. Black. I love cottage cheese, but I like it with seasoned salt and pepper. Never with fruit. Never, ever, ever with fruit. You can get a deluxe marine salad bowl, tomatoes with green peppers, Neptune seafood salad, marine combination, asparagus tips, a shrimp louis, crab or shrimp salad, crab louis, potato salad, or fruit salad, avocado a la horn. The fuck is that? There isn't really a recipe, but for my best bet, It was with corn and cucumber, avocado, corn, and cucumber. You can get lobster salad. And for your salad, you can choose from French dressing, mayonnaise, or Thousand Island dressing with any of them, or Bernstein's special dressing. I would love to know what that is. Let's see if we can find out. Well, there's no way to know because there's literally a salad dressing company called Bernstein's. So not going to be able to find this Bernstein's special dressing. As for salad add-ons, you can add buccaneer for 25 cents. I looked that up. That seems to be some kind of barbecued meat. That seems to be the origin of the word buccaneer. Uh, You can add Rockfort cheese, chili sauce, Louis sauce, Imperial Russian, hollandaise, or vegetables. Sandwiches, they have lettuce and crab for 35 cents, abalone sandwich, oysters on toast, ham and egg, Swiss cheese, fried ham, pirate open face and potato salad, Denver sandwich, tuna sandwich, fried egg sandwich, sardine, and caviar. Caviar sandwich? The most expensive sandwich in the world. What? That's 50 cents. Potatoes. You can have a baked potato from 5 to 8 p.m. for 15 cents. Boiled mashed or french fries, 15 cents. BT dubs, I was going to look up the price conversion to how much this would be today. But if you go to the menu online, the date says unknown. Actually, the decade says unknown. So I wasn't able to do that. You can have them cottage style That is like the cubed casserole with the cornflakes on top and cheddar cheese, milk, breadcrumbs, butter. That is cottage potatoes. Yum. You can have shoestring fries. You can have potatoes O'Brien, which is sauteed with um, peppers and onions, or potatoes lyonnaise which is a French preparation where you pan fry them to make them crispy and you add butter, parsley, and onion and salt and pepper. You can get hashed potatoes and cream, hash browns, long branch, American fried or creamed potatoes for 20 cents, gratin, sweet 
potato, southern style. You can get a Gratin O'Brien or fried sweet potatoes. It says add order a fish or shellfish planked for 50 cents extra. What does that mean? Duh. I'm an idiot. Cooked on a wooden plank. Yeah, I knew that. They have a today's catch section and it says fish are caught at 5 a.m. and served the same day. You can get poached red snapper for 50 cents, creamed fish a la king, casserole, baked deep sea cod, crab croquettes, and cream sauce with new garden peas. Yum. Baked barracuda with fresh mushrooms, steamed halibut supreme, boiled spring salmon with egg sauce, boiled skate, drawn butter, and new potatoes. You can get fried filet of sole with tartar sauce, marinated herring Holland style, grilled or fried sea bass with parsley butter, fried or broiled barracuda, grilled English sole, large Louisiana prawns Creole style, fried Rex sole, gefilte fish hot or cold, Spanish mackerel, salmon or halibut steak. You can get turbo with parsley butter, smelts with tartar sauce, fried frog, Puget Sound scallops with tartar sauce, rainbow trout vegetable plate or you can get spaghetti or macaroni with mushrooms italian sauce and cheese under vegetables specials old-fashioned potato salad new green asparagus with butter sauce artichoke cotter cold corn on the cob garden spinach stewed tomatoes fresh string beans fresh coleslaw cauliflower gratin fresh garden peas or buttered beets dessert specials are an old-fashioned strawberry shortcake for a quarter, fresh strawberry pie with whipped cream, fresh strawberries with cream, fresh peaches and cream, whole or half cantaloupe, figs and cream, chilled watermelon, assorted pies, homemade Hungarian strudel, assorted sorbets, and assorted pastries. And there's a section for favorites. It says captain's dinner. There's chopino or bouillabaisse, fish stew, an epicurean delight of clams, lobster, crab, bass, halibut, and salmon served in an abalone shell. Fresh croutons, imported saffron, 85 cents. That I would order. There's a photo of these ones, by the way. It looks amazing. I'll include them on the social media, but it looks amazing. With the chopino, a lot of the times there's like a couple of the seafoods in there that I don't like, so I won't order it. But this, I like everything in there. And I'm sure it's delicious. Oh, yes. I went back just now and was Googling this again because it's on the side of the specials. It says Lobster Princess again. And I was like, what is Lobster Princess? Could not find anything on the internet. But now we have a photo and a description because it's under the captain's specials. It is a baked lobster with hearts of artichoke, fresh mushrooms, green peppers, served in a lobster shell. Sherry wine adds an elegant touch. And it's $1.25. Oh, another mystery. Pieces of eight. I actually cut that because I could not figure that out. There's a photo. It says timbal of lobster, shrimp, crab legs, tomatoes, avocado, buccaneer dressing. Oh, buccaneer is a dressing. (laughs) It says buccaneer dressing, make this fit for the gods, 75 cents. There are a lot of typos on this menu. Okay, or last Captain Seafood special, seafood platter, a potpourri of delicacies from the sea and shore, half cold lobster, shrimps, crab legs, clams, oysters on a half shell. Dressing, so unusual exclamation point. I would like to know which of those things are from the shore because they're all from the sea. Hence the title seafood platter. But looks good. Actually, no, it looks horrifying. Everything's plated in that horrific 1950s way where it looks kind of terrifying and like it's going to eat you. But teasing about the menu and the plating, like I'm obsessed with this place. I love it. I would go here all the time if I could, and I want them to bring it back. It doesn't diminish my love. It just makes my love stronger because I like weirdness. Cute. Their coasters are a little champagne coupe, and it says champagne cocktail 50 cents, the bridge special. And inside of the champagne coupe is an overhead view of the Golden Gate Bridge. It's adorable. This menu is massive. Okay, there's a little bit more, and I definitely want to go over all of it because this is so much fun. 
Aw. It says you're welcome to take this menu home or send it to your friends. Ask your waiter for an envelope. That's adorable. Oh my God. It says when in Los Angeles, be sure to visit Bernstein's Fish Grotto, 424 West 6th Street, Los Angeles. I can't find any menus or photos of the LA one, but it was located at 424 West 6th and it is right by the Pershing Square Metro. It's like mm, half a block away from there. So it was downtown. Back to the menu. It also says, 26 years ago, our first fish grotto was a tiny stall, 6 feet by 12. Today, Bernstein's fish grottos, the only ones of their kind in America, enjoy a unique reputation for quality foods and solicitous service. Fish caught at 5 a.m. are served to you the same day. No attempt is ever made at substitution. And then last but not least, we have their special luncheons. There are no substitutions. Do not even ask. So the special lunches are served from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. And they're by day of the week. This is a steal. So you get a beverage, a soup, a salad, an entree, and a dessert, and vegetables, and potatoes. And depending on the fish you choose, it's anywhere between 45 cents and 65 cents. So you get coffee, tea, milk, or beer. Then you get to pick between clam chowder, clam broth, and mock turtle soup. It's then served with salad, which is shredded lettuce with chopped egg and mayonnaise. For entrees, you can have steamed sea cod with parsley sauce, fried sand dabs a la Bay Bridge, fried Rex sole with meunier, baked red snapper Italian style, or creamed Alaska cod Delmonico. And then you get vegetables, doesn't say what, and potatoes, doesn't say how. Then for dessert, you can have either rice custard pudding with vanilla sauce, jello with whipped cream, or ice cream with cookies. That is for Monday. So for Tuesday, the only thing that changes is the fish that day and the dessert. But you can get creamed fish a la king, grilled individual English sole, seafood patties and casserole, poached red snapper supreme, boned silver smelts with parsley butter. And for dessert, they have banana fritters with brandy sauce, pie or ice cream and cookies. Wednesday, you can get lobster bisque instead of mock turtle soup. It also has salad royale, whatever that is. And then you can get creamed sea bass, fried filet of English sole, seafood patties, fried sea cod steak with brown butter, abalone steak with tartar sauce. Desserts are bread and butter pudding with vanilla sauce, jello or ice cream and cookies. Thursday, it's a combination salad. The soup is the same. You can get steamed filet rock cod with Italian sauce, grilled red snapper with parsley butter, creamed crab casserole, grilled halibut with lemon butter, or bouillabaisse. Yum. Dessert includes sherbet. Friday, the salad is hearts of lettuce with French dressing. You can get poached red snapper with fine herbs, fried filet of sole, creamed Alaska cod, boned sand dabs, creamed abalone with fresh mushrooms, desserts jello or ice cream. Saturday, you can get the lobster bisque again. The salad is pineapple and cottage cheese with cream dressing. Ugh. And you can get creamed whitefish a la king, corn fritters, and bacon. Yum. Sea bass steak with parsley butter, baked filet of sole gratin, creamed lobster patty and casserole. Dessert is preserved fruits, pie, pudding, or ice cream. You cannot have a special on Sunday. Don't even think about it. You also cannot have it on holidays. You also cannot substitute anything they want to reiterate. I can tell you from experience, people will still try 4,000 times a day. And that is the menu and history of Bernstein's Fish Grotto in San Francisco. I had a fucking blast going over that menu. How just delightful is that? I wish it was still around and I wish it was the same boat. Like I don't want a replica. I want the same everything, same menu, same boat, same mermaid, same prices would be great. Like we should bring it back. And that is cooking with a serial killer. And that serial killer is Dorothea Puente. And Dorothea Puente sucks. And she murdered a ton of people. And I hope she made zero dollars off of this shitty cookbook. But it was fun to roast her. And something different. Food and serial killers. Hopefully I'm not the only one in the world that enjoys the combination. I'm probably not. That's it for today. I hope you had a good time. I hope you learned something and found it interesting. And... 
that's it. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye. Full source notes are available at mistressofthemacabrepodcast.com as well as photos pertaining to each episode. Follow along on Instagram for all the insane and gory photos at Mistress of the Macabre Podcast. Please leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps the show grow, and I will love you forever. And tell a friend, if you even have any. Bonus content is available at patreon.com or on Apple Podcast subscriptions. I'm just one young teenage girl writing, researching, producing, editing, and recording the show. Your support goes a long way. If you have topic ideas, questions, comments, animal facts, or unsettling stories you'd like to share, email me at mistressofthemacabrepodcast at gmail.com.